Hello again, everyone. So we're down to our last two sessions of day four of WFS Live. I tell you what, I have to say, this has been the most varied day of content I think we've ever had on a World Football Summit platform. We, we, we started off talking about WFS talent and uh, you know gender equality plans and things like that, which was really, really important. We're, we're returning to something, I suppose, of that ilk right now. But in the meantime, we've been around the world. We've been to Africa. We've been to Asia. We've talked about AI and digital innovation. We've talked about European leagues and how they handled COVID. We've talked about creativity, both in terms of fan engagement and in terms of content, the, the golden age of content. So many fascinating discussions, really fascinating discussions, really fun conversations, great insights. And that last panel, wow, absolutely box office with Jonathan Barnett, Amina Raiola, Gianluca Di Marzio and Daniele Bocucci, uh, all discussing the world of, of agency uh, and of football agents. And um, admittedly, some, some strong words fired in the direction of, of FIFA. Uh, we'll see if we can get them back on in a future WFS event to respond, maybe even get the two parties together. We're peace. That's what we're about. We're about peace and love. OK, well, let's move on, shall we? Um, our next session uh, is about rewriting masculinity. Um, what does it mean to be masculine? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take this very literally. The definition used by the uh, Oxford English Dictionary actually plays it quite safe. It says having qualities or appearance traditionally associated with men. But there's a, a key operative word there, which is traditionally. What, what tradition has dictated, what society has decreed, the stereotypes that have existed for so long, well, that is under real threat and thank goodness for that because quite simply those notions have been toxic for too long not expressing emotions masking vulnerability acting macho or alpha male it all just feels so outdated doesn't it and um, we as a sport as a society can absolutely do more we can do better so how can we and that's we all of us athletes brands organizations media not just combat Tech, toxic uh, masculinity, but even extinguish it once and for all. Easier said than done, but as I say, steps in the right direction can be taken. So this session brought to you in partnership with the men's magazine GQ is entitled Rewriting Masculinity, Sports Challenge Against Toxic Gender Stereotypes. And, and these are the voices who hopefully uh, will give us some ideas and plenty of hope. Uh, they are the former professional footballer in North America and Singapore, Thomas Beattie, uh, the former rugby league player in the NRL and in Super League here in the UK, Nick Youngquest, and your moderator, journalist from uh, GQ magazine, Hector Izquierdo. Uh, a fascinating, a fascinating conversation awaits, I'm sure, Hector. Over to you. Thomas, who are speaking to us from Australia and Singapore, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, I know you're making an effort to just stay awake and attend this panel. I think it will be worth it. So we have two brilliant and very experienced speakers on, on the matter of masculinity and sport today. Uh, I can't wait to hear uh, what you have to say. But first of all, uh, before we go further, I would like to make a brief introduction to this panel about rewriting masculinity. Uh, as David said, uh, masculinity is a work in progress. And uh, as the world's uh, leading men's magazine, we at GQ uh, have witnessed that process over the past decades and uh, have contributed to shape a modern uh, masculinity. So during all these years, uh, more than 25 already in Spain, uh, we have seen how football players uh, went from being sport heroes to icons of style. Uh, last year, without going any farther, we published a cover uh, starring Karim Benzema in a Balenciaga denim jacket that would have been uh, unimaginable just a few years ago. Football players uh, have opened up to, to fashion, to racial diversity or gender equality, but there are still barriers to tear down. And at GQ, we are convinced that it is uh, necessary to continue uh, pushing forward to a more inclusive and rich masculinity. Uh, especially among those who, due to uh, their status as modern heroes, are the mirror uh, in which our children look at themselves. So we believe that change is good and also necessary. So let me clarify what do we mean in a men's magazine like GQ when we talk about toxic masculinity and what it means to rewrite uh, that toxic masculinity into something different and, and of course, better. When we talk about rewriting masculinity, we are talking about changing the way we relate to women, of course, uh, but also the way we relate to ourselves. Uh, we're talking about breaking the rules of uh, an outdated masculinity and uh, ultimately uh, being more free you know, as men. Uh, we are talking about living our masculinity in a fuller way and not by uh, opposition to, to the other gender. 
whether you are heterosexual or gay. Uh, we will talk later uh, about what it means to be gay in the world of football specifically. But I would like to start with what it means to live an incomplete and harmful uh, masculinity in the world of sport in general and how that can affect the mental health of the athletes and lead them uh, to experience situations of depression and, and even suicide. suicide sorry. Uh, I will start with you, Nick. Uh, I guess that the traditional image that any athlete has always wanted to project is that of a powerful, unbeatable, untouchable, uh, even aggressive man. Uh, almost like a superhero who does not suffer, who does not love himself. Uh, and we think uh, that all these traits uh, are masculine values. That is what is expected of a man who, who behaves like a man. Uh, you had a long and successful career uh, in rugby. How is this reality perceived from that leads uh, inner psychology? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, if you, if you think about it more broadly in society, um, we're, we're talking about this idea of, uh, of not showing any weakness, right? Um, and, and, and as I said, more broadly, you talk about the way in which boys and men are exposed to, you know, don't act like a girl, don't be a pussy. These kind of, um, this kind of language that you're exposed to from a young age, um, it can become very, very um, difficult for, to, to kind of conceptualize um, what it is to show fear, emotion, vulnerability. And we establish this kind of idea of, 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 of dominance and, and hierarchy and power in a way that's, uh, that, that actually becomes quite, as we hear talking about toxic masculinity, toxic in nature. Um, and one, in, one that is really not um, indicative of being able to, to connect on the emotional levels or, 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 or at the depths that, um, that, that really constitute um, living a fulfilled and, and fruitful life. You know, I think that especially coming from, from, from a game like rugby, it's, um, you know, it's, it's almost a status like, uh, kind of idea. If you think about, uh, on the, on the spectrum of kind of concussion and all this sort of stuff, right. Um, you know, it's a badge of honor almost to, to be concussed and then to get up and, 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 and to continue playing, you know, rather than showing, showing your, your, your deepest vulnerabilities and understanding when it's time to go off you know, or, or, or it's time to, to express that you're hurt, you know, so uh, yeah, it, it becomes really, really difficult. And um, for me, it's uh, it, it, it extended so far as to I never really felt like I fitted into any of the teams I played with, but it, it extended to this idea of of showing my worth in other ways that were apparently manly, you know, by drinking so much beer that you can't stand up, um, and, and 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 by experiencing sexual expression with women. And then talking about it in the locker room, you know, doing doing these things that I would never, have, I would never do. It wasn't me, but it all, almost made me fit into the team environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, uh, in fact, uh, the most uh, uh, the worst thing uh, about this toxic masculinity uh, is uh, that it disables uh, at least to express uh, their negative emotions such as fear, anxiety, depression, and uh, of course to ask uh, for help. Uh, Thomas, uh, do you think that showing this emotion uh, is still seen as a weakness in the world of, of football? Yeah, definitely. I think that not just in football, I think in most sports, as, as Nick said, I think um, anything which is going to show a little bit of vulnerability or, or honesty or just really hard emotion is, is kind of seen as this chink in your armor. You kind of, as an athlete, you're expected to, to be this commodity almost, this, this robot. Um, and any sign of, of kind of weakness in that is, is preyed upon. Um, and it can be difficult for people to maneuver around it. I think even from within sport, it's, a, it's such a volatile, uh, short career. Athletes in general, I think, uh, are scared to kind of really show that, that vulnerability because, it, again, you, somebody's always waiting to take your place and, and that can, can really re redefine your career. So I think within sport, it's, it's a difficult environment to really be really be brutally honest and raw and, and really show that true emotion and, and i think um as nick said that it, it is toxic it's, it's damaging and and it's not authentic we know that the more authentic we are the more productive we are and so you know hiding or masking them emotions although from the outside it seems like it's a sign of strength in all honesty it's, it's the complete opposite we know it's more courageous to, to kind of really show how you feel and, and what you think and and that takes a lot of courage um to be brutally honest with people and, and especially go against what the majority of people are, are doing or saying or being 
So yeah, I think that is a, definitely a misconception, but it is definitely true. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, uh, I think uh, football players only talk about these issues once they are retired, uh, like you, Thomas, for example. Uh, Nick, uh, you have a foundation dedicated to working with athletes on mental health issues, uh, Athletes for Life. Uh, why do you think this happens and how can it be changed? Yeah, um, with Athletes for Life, we, we really work on, 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 on athletic identity transformation, right? So it's, it's really allowing athletes to see them for, for more than who they are as sports people, okay? So we know that the, the, the athlete we see on the field is, uh, is fantastically talented and, and they've worked really hard to be there. But there's so much more than that. I think if you think about this more broadly, if you, if you ask a, uh, an electrician or, or a carpenter who they are, they don't answer the question by saying, I'm a carpenter. They're a father, they're a, they're a, they're a husband first, you know? Um, but lots of sports people will associate this idea with, I'm a soccer player or a football player, I'm a rugby player. Um, so we try and really challenge challenge the athletes to, to to step outside of that um that identity that they've built up for 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 many years and and um and and really exemplify who they are and empower those around them by 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 sharing their their deepest vulnerabilities as as we've been talking about you know I think that it's it's very interesting you know with with sport we we continuously build up this hedge hegemonic uh, kind of idea of masculinity that that anything that doesn't conform to the normal societal um kind of uh, ideas or the conventional ideas of masculinity is, is is weak right and um we know that that's not true and you know I, i was lucky enough actually thomas i'm not sure if you know this but to play with the only openly gay rugby player at the time um in 2011 and i just remembered some of the, my my experiences with him in the in in, in the locker room he, he wasn't able to be his complete self you know because It, it was almost that he was seen as inferior, even though this guy was like a super strong and um, a, a powerful guy. It was almost like the, the the team environment just took away from all this strength, you know, because he was gay. And it, it really had a profound impact on me. But many, many years later when I reflected, you know, so um, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, it, we want people to be themselves, you know, authenticity is the, is, is the only way to be in life, right? And, um, but sport can really detract from that in so many ways sometimes. Mm -hmm. Was that Gareth Thomas? Thank you. Yeah, it was with with, with Alpha. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, uh, we 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 played together. He came, he, he actually came out in um just just before coming to rugby league and uh, and, and it was it, it was it was super super fascinating. You know, um, the, the first of all the the kind of aura that he brought to the to the game, but then also the fanfare about him being gay. I was like, man, like. For me, it was nothing, you know. But for everyone else, it was this huge thing, you know. And uh, and and yeah. well, you know, being he, a heterosexual he man, I can't understand. It, right? that. Yeah, <laughs> in a way, right? In a way, it, like it's it, yeah. It's it, so it, it was really it was really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, another of the <laughs> another of the stereotypes of masculinity associated with uh, elite football. Uh, perhaps reinforced uh, today by social networks, is that playing uh, for one of the big teams gives you access to a world of, of power, money, fame, uh, expensive cars, and uh, almost unlimited access to, to the most beautiful women on the planet. Uh, I think this is dangerous uh, for many young players with their minds uh, not, really, not, not sorry, yet uh, fully formed. Uh, this one is for you, Thomas. Uh, in what way can these stereotypes affect the personal and professional development of uh, young football players? And uh, what, what can be done to change this idea of success, which has nothing to do with the sporting success after all? Yeah, massively. I think, um, <clears throat> I think football is, especially we see at the highest level, we see the, the things you mentioned, you know, players with unlimited access to, to whatever it is they desire. And, and I think that can be... Um, it can be a harmful message to send out to especially young, young, younger children, boys and girls. I mean, not everybody's going to reach that pinnacle. Right. And so I think the, the, um, the underlying passion for the sport really needs to be the, the sole uh, intrinsic desire as opposed to the, the consequences of, of success. I think this is another thing, which is, is also misguided. The, um, the idea of success, what is success? Um, And I think we, now, now more than ever, there's so much money in sport and, and football in particular. I think it is a, you know, it adds that appeal 
to especially the younger generation but i think again it's it's one that's unrealistic you know the the reality is 0.1 percent of people will actually reach and attain any somewhere any anywhere close to that um so i think again that's one of the, the things that over over time will become more apparent but it's as more and money more and more money start start to come into the game i think it will that will attract more and more young people to to be a, a passion more than it, the actual passion for the sport um but in reality as as i'm sure nick and many other people know there's there's different levels to to this and you know people at the pinnacle they will they will experience this at the elite level in in the in the major leagues but the majority of people throughout the rest of professional sport they kind of sit somewhere in this middle ground um, which is not to say, again, it's not to say that there's not as, as much success because success is however we define it, right? It's different for everybody. Um, but yeah, that is something also that I think is, is worrying and especially with social media now, it's so easy to to connect and, and people show their highlight reel. You know, you're going to see the, the best bits of everybody's life. So again, that's something that's, I think, slightly unhealthy, but it is the times we're living in now and, and I think um, that's only going to increase. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, uh, people often think that GQ is a magazine uh, made for men, by men. Uh, but the truth is that the team uh, has always been made up of 50% uh, men and 50% women. And uh, I think that uh, has given us more right enriching perspective on the issues that uh, affect masculinity. Uh, we all know that all male groups can be tricky. Uh, Nick. You played, uh, you talked about that before in a sport uh, where the bond of the group is, is, is very strong. Uh, how does peer pressure affect the setting of these uh, toxic uh, stereotypes uh, we're talking about? Yeah, I think that there is a, a, a culture that is established that, you, you know, you, you end up becoming implicit um, with your, your, your behavior to the, to the kind of culture that's, that's established, right? So, um, and I think that, you know, more broadly for me, and this is just for me speaking, I was probably exposed to some of the poorest leaders in the world during my, during my rugby career. Um, I don't think it's really indicative of, of, of fostering an environment that's, um, that's, that's in that empowering because it's all surrounding uh, performance, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, you come into this, into this idea that, you have to drink as much beer as you can and you have to do all these things to to to, to be accepted right um and I, I don't think that it's really um you know as i said fostering an environment for for young men um especially young men who are, are coming into a prof their, their first professional roles in their lives and earning a lot of money it's not really giving us this um this this idea of um of sharing ourselves wholly um, you know, there's this whole hypersexual sexualization of, of, of females, and, and as you said, that you know, you have this, you have this access to pretty much anything you want, and it becomes, um, becomes quite troublesome. And I think, you know, as I said before, I look back on some of my, the things that I've done in my life. Um, you know, many of them have been fantastic, but there's some that I've been really kind of, I think back and I like, really, did I really do that? You know, and it's, it's a really a byproduct of, of a toxic and, and, and a, a culture that's not really indicative of, of being the, the, the best and the wholest person you can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, talking specifically uh, about being gay, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Nick talked a little bit uh, about it uh, before, but do you think uh, it is still considered a weakness in the world of football, being gay? Yeah, definitely. I think um, not just within football, but in society as well. I think there's this misconception that sexuality and masculinity are linked i mean we we know this is not true right i know some of the most feminine straight people and i also know some of the most masculine gay people and so i think we're still trying to redefine um <clears throat> what masculinity is it's, it's evolved over time and uh and so genders roles fashion these things have evolved but i think the stigma and the stereotype has somewhat remained or stayed the same i think um being being gay in in sport especially football which is such a, a physical contact sport um you know it's there's, there's this ideology or this you kind of become trapped in these norms um and so anyone who falls outside of these norms or these expectations we're supposed to live up to is considered weak and then sexual orientation is one of them but i think and just vulnerability in general um speaking about um sexual orientation being one 
um, alcohol, substance addiction, depression, anything that falls outside of these norms of being this robust, strong, um, non-emotion showing individual is, is considered a weakness. And so, yeah, I definitely think um, being in the LGBT community is something that would that is still considered by large parts of society a weakness within sport. <laughs> Just quickly, uh, but, you know, but... when I... When when I played rugby, I I always supported the LGBTQ community, yeah, and I was actually I was actually marginalised myself, you know, and I think that the fear of marginalisation for someone on their sexuality within within any in, environment, you know, whether a team at in a, a soccer team in a, uh, in work is 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 you know not the way that we want to go down in twenty twenty. Thank you, uh, but yeah, if you look at yeah, if you look, uh, look at uh, female football, for example, women's football, uh, the most important icon today is Megan Rabinow, who's uh, openly gay. Uh, and in other disciplines of female uh, sport, uh, being gay is something that is, I would say, quite normalized. Uh, we recently wrote a story at GQ about sexual diversity in the world of football, and we were amazed at how little progress has been has been uh, made in this uh, regard. Uh, Thomas, why in the world of men's football is it impossible today for this normalization to take place? I think um, when we compare the women's game and the men's game, it's, it's slightly different because I think um, there's this misconception that if you're a female and you play football, there's a strong chance that you're gay. And if you're, and if you're a male and you play football, there is no way you can be gay. And so again, it's it's just we're trying to redefine and, and rewrite the and uh, rewrite almost these norms. Um, it's something that I struggled with personally. It was it was difficult for me to kind of feel like I, I really fitted in, in in certain environments. I think um, in the men's game, which obviously I'm speaking from experience, you look around you and you see you don't see anybody else who is who's similar or the same, and so. You, it's a path that's so untrodden. There's no data. There's not enough people who have been through that, that, uh, that experience to really look around and say, it's going to be okay. I know, I know it will be okay. There's enough people to lean on. There's enough leaders. I can, there's idols who I can emulate in that mold. Um, and again, I think what it comes down to is that, that misunderstanding of what, of what it really is and sexuality and masculinity and, and that them being completely separate. Um, I think as a female, there's this, um, it's, it's a wrong it's a wrong perception of it but if, if you're a female who's lesbian um, then uh, that's that would be a benefit for you in, in football on the other side as a male it would be seen as a weakness again they're both they're both not true and they're false and it's a misrepresentation of the community but it that is typically what society has kind of led us to believe and again we're we're trying to get outside these norms and and, and really redefine what it means and I think I think the media, in my opinion, the media have a you know a strong responsibility to showcase that it's cyclical, right? We need players to come out, but how do we do that? How do we create an environment? What's the game plan to to really create this environment so people can feel safe to actually come out? Because sport is football, especially is um, it's a talking point. People gather around the table, they eat meals, they sit together, and they talk about football. And so, you know, we need people to come out to start normalizing it. How do we do that? You know, is there a game plan in place to really make sure? It's an environment which is conducive to really start to break down them, them stereotypes, which you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that uh, other players uh, came out and, and, uh, and talk would also help. But uh, and, and we have seen in the last years that they uh, that they have spoken out in, in, in favor of causes uh, that fight uh, this toxic masculinity, such as uh, feminism or racial diversity. But why it is it so difficult for them to come out in favor of, of the gay community? It's, it's for both of you, whoever wants to answer. Nick, do you want to answer that? Because obviously you'd technically be an ally as such, right? So... Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, you know, it's one thing that I've really toyed with my, my entire life. <laughs> and, and being a, you know, a heterosexual man, it, it, it was much easier, right? Um, why is it so hard for people to come out? It, it, it's this fear of marginal, marginalization. Um, as Thomas said, you know, it, it, there's no openly gay soccer players right now playing, right? Is that correct? Yeah, um, that's correct. In the lower leagues I mean, in America, there's, there's Colin yeah. Martin and stuff, but yeah. Okay, I mean, 
that you know, if you look at the numbers of, of, of across participation, it is just not feasible to think that there is no gay players, gay, gay um, males playing in, in these sports. You know, um, it, it's not feasible in society, right? And um, I, and I agree with Thomas. I think you know, society, society, and then with sport more broadly, probably we we establish this idea of um, you know uh, that. Anything that is less, anything that is lesser than the than the conventional kind of idea of masculinity is 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 weakness, right? Or is inferior. Um, so yeah, I I mean, I don't really know how to answer the question, but it, it's you would like to, to think that you could establish an environment where everyone felt whole, everyone felt safe, and everyone felt welcomed. Um, and and specifically when you talk about sport, because sport is so driven by performance. You know, so so what the hell does it matter what 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 your sexuality is? You know, <laughs> it's really strange. Yeah, so, since I, since I actually came out, it's something I've I've questioned a lot, to be honest. Um, of the last four months, it's, it is a you know you do often wonder where are where are the allies in football who are who are straight and um who don't don't come out and support that and and kind of put their name forward and and I think it does take a certain level of comfortability and confidence in, in who you are to, you mm -hmm. know, to come out and say, you know, I know who I am. It's okay, but I'm in support of this. I want every, I want to, I want to live in a world. I, I want to be in an environment. I want my teammates to feel free and expressive and, and be who they are. That's going to make them better. It's going to make me better. It's going to make us better. Um, and you don't hear that in all honesty. I, <clears throat> I think I had an example in the previous week when there was a, somebody in the Premier League who had said he was, he was gay and he was, he was struggling to come out and he was having difficulties. And, and I think people, it then started this witch hunt on social media. And uh, I think you had people like Luke Shaw and, and you know, coming out on, on Twitter and, and distancing themselves saying, well, that's not me. Um, which I think is, is also quite detrimental. I mean, it's almost like this, I'm not a part of them. I don't want, don't, don't log me into this group. Um, so yeah, it is a question I've also wondered. I think it takes a lot of strength and courage and confidence in who you are um, to to come out and and be in support of that because it can then put you in the firing line, right? And as we said, there's not there's not enough examples and uh, to know how that will go. And so even as an ally, I think it would be quite, you know, they would be quite fearful to to group themselves and be in, be in support of that. I, I would hope over time that people would start to start to come out a little bit more and who are, who are currently playing at a high level and, and speak openly about how they would be in support of it because I, I, I'm very confident based on my experience after coming out that most most players are more than okay with it and I've had great support and, and I've gone through that process so I, I think that would be really beneficial for the community. And the, the fear of marginalisation is still there. If, if, you, if you think about um, the only openly gay NFL player at the time was, um, I'm going to forget his name, it's Michael someone. He, he was an African American guy. He was drafted to Michael Sam. He was drafted to the to to, to St. Louis, right? The Rams, I, I believe. And he was actually a very, very, very talented player. Um, went on to really not represent that team at all, right? Um, so it makes total sense why you know um, anyone who was in a system and they they associate with being gay wouldn't come out because th these are the kind of examples you, you're setting, you know? Um, so yeah, we have to do a better job. And, and as allies, we have to do a better job too, to, to make you feel, to make people feel comfortable to be themselves. That's, that, that's the key. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Thomas, uh, I, I don't know if you shared uh, uh, your sexual orientation with any uh, uh, teammate or club officer, but I, I imagine that many of your teammates uh, loved you and cared about you. Uh, do you ever think that if you spoke to them honestly about uh, how that situation made, made you feel, uh, they would at least uh, be understanding and supportive? Definitely. I mean, I know that I know that now from from after coming out. You know, I've had amazing support from teammates, people I've played against, coaches. Um, you know, every officials. I've had great support, um, and so I know now looking back, it, that experience was was a lot less um it was different in real life to what it was in my mind i know i could have come out to many of my teammates who now know about me and, and i've got great relationships with in fact i've got better relationships with many of them now um now there's no barrier there and i can be free and 
just a lot more closer. I think, again, vulnerability is endearing, right? It connects us, that honesty and that authenticity. So I've been able to kind of use it in, in all honesty for good to really build these stronger connections with people I've played with. Um, I never actually did. Um, I never told anyone whilst I was playing. I was still really trying to embrace it and accept it myself. And it was something that I think as a, as a gay athlete in the closet, you, there's no going back once you start telling that story to anyone. Um, and so that's the difficult thing. I think it's more self-acceptance than it is, would my teammates be okay with it? Would the coaches be okay with it? It was, it was the fact that once I'd said it, it was real. It was there. It was, it, I couldn't go back with it. So yeah, looking back, I could have done that, but uh, I didn't. And, and that was just the way it played out. And, and again, I don't have any regrets. I, I do often think things could have been different, but I, you know, I think it played out the way it was supposed to do. And, and hopefully I can have an impact and, and make sure that for future generations, they, they don't go through that struggle or, you know, struggle with identity the way, the way I and, and many players are currently doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, actually, I, I have the impression that uh, if uh, an elite football player decided to come out of the closet, the majority of society would see it uh, as normal or even positive. Uh, in my opinion, uh, he would become a hero for most of the people. Uh, the sports source uh, maybe would ruffle him off. Uh, and yet the fear uh, endures. Uh, why does this happen? Is it because the football player lives in a very closed world and in that closed world, uh, the input he receives are radically different? Yeah, uh, I think, Thomas? again, it's this... this um, I think this is this vulnerability again, you know, people, people are just scared to show vulnerability. It's, it's classed as, it's looked upon as a weakness. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. There, there would be a lot of sponsors. I think most of a lot of society would be quite accepting of that. Again, it depends where you are. It depends what country you're playing in. It depends what country you're living in. You know, society is different on these things. And some places are a lot more progressive than others. You know, if you, if you're playing in the in the Emirates, for example, you're going to have a different experience if you're playing for LA Galaxy. So there's a lot of nuances and sensitivity around it, but I think you're right in saying that in certain areas it, it would be embraced by sponsors, it would be embraced by certain uh, media and, and fans. I think none of that, though, ever, ever outweigh the fear what goes on in, in your mind, personally. Mm -hmm. You could have told me I, there would be a, a million sponsors and X amount of dollars and it still wouldn't have uh, persuaded me to, to do something I weren't ready to do. Because again, it's such a, a difficult thing to maneuver through. There's so much, so few examples. It's, um, it feels like the weight of the, sh the world is on your shoulders and you carry that daily. You know, it, it breeds this epidemic of loneliness. Um, and so you, you kind of fall deeper and deeper into this cycle and you almost distance yourself from it you kind of get to this point where you just you're married to your sport and, and that's just something you bury at the back of your at the back of your mind and and you lock that away so it, for me personally I, I distance myself from that I kind of that's not me you know I'm not that um when in all honesty I, I I knew who I was but I just was reluctant to accept it so I, I do think you're right I think in uh depending on where you're playing and where you live large parts of society would still be accepting I, I think in other areas people would struggle but I don't think any of that uh, outweighs the, the fear which goes on in people's minds um, prior to, to coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so uh, this is uh, probably the last question. And uh, I would like it to be for both of you. Uh, positively speaking, uh, what kind of actions uh, should we take uh, to combat this type of toxic uh, masculinity in a sport. I imagine that education of our children is, is really important, but also that these children can look at their idols and uh, imitate them, right? Uh, Nick? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, education... For, for... I... Go on, Nick. Go ahead, Tommy. <laughs> go ahead. I was say, educa obviously, edu education is massive, right? I mean, it's a lot easier to, to, um, to have an impact on someone who's eight, nine, and 10 than it is for somebody who's 50, 60 years old, who's thought something for a long period of time. But at the same time, we don't just want to accept that this is what it is now. And we have to wait for the new generation. We want to, you know, we want to be constantly changing the narrative and redefining that. And 
And I think it starts by taking control of that. You know, what is the plan? Let's create some boundaries. Let's create some, you know, what we're going to tolerate, what, we, what we're not. In, in football stadiums, for example, you know, it's, you can't walk into a football stadium and rightfully so uh, be, be chanting home, uh, racist slurs. You shouldn't be able to do that and you can't do that. And there's consequences for these actions now. On the other hand, I think we need to also have them for, you know, homophobia, for the LGBT community. These things need to be in place as well, because like I said previously, you know, football is a talking point. Football is a massive influencer of culture and society um, on many things, fashion, music, all this kind of embedded into one thing. And so I think if we can create an environment which is more conducive for players, these type of people, you know, players can feel more comfortable eventually to come out when there's a plan in place and there's some, some security for them. And, and these can have an effect on society, which can over time start to change these norms and, and normalize different sexual orientation. So I think, you know, education is key, but I think also creating a plan is, is paramount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, for, for me, as I, for me, as I mentioned at the start, I think that it starts from a young age and, and it's not necessarily you know, sports fault, right? Um, I, I think it's, it's it's society more broadly, and we have to, you know, start renorming these kind of ideas of sexuality and and, and sharing vulnerability and, and and encouraging men and providing and safeguarding this idea of sharing your deepest uh, and, and vulnerabilities um, more broadly. And 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 sport is 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 just going to amplify that, you know. Um, sport is a fantastic vehicle to evoke social change. We all know that, um, and so if we can start to, to, to evoke this, uh, you know, earlier on in the, in, in young boys' lives and, and make them feel comfortable, feel safe, feel themselves. I think that we're going to get to the point in the end and, and, and sport is going to, is really going to be the vehicle for that change as well. Okay. So, uh, we're finishing on time because, uh, we're a troop of professionals here. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're athletes, I, we're athletes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You performed really well. Uh, so thank you very much. I think uh, it was really, really interesting. And uh, uh, we will let David to, to, to make, uh, to make his, his appearance on the screen. Wow, do you guys want to come and work for Sky? You've been the best so far in keeping the time. Absolutely beautifully done. Thank you very much indeed. Oh God. Um, no, guys, listen, um, no, seriously, look, we've dealt with a, a very delicate topic there. Thank you, first of all, for speaking so openly, honestly, candidly. Um, and I think, you know, we, we did actually discover quite a lot of, of complexity within the topic. So, you know, when you said, Nick, anything that doesn't conform to a societal definition of masculinity is weak. That's kind of like what the problem we've got right now. Um, and, and we know it's wrong. You're absolutely right. We do uh, know it's wrong and, and the authenticity is key. Um, you know, we, we've talked about authenticity a lot of this week in lots of different contexts, but especially in this one, being being able to be yourself and, and having the strength to be yourself. But of course, it, it is incredibly difficult to, to do so. Um, Tom is talking about, uh, I suppose, the, uh, the, the, the misrepresentation of, of the community and having to to rewrite the norms, but the stigma still remains. Uh, and also um, just, I suppose it's, it's difficult with social media, isn't it? Because there is some unhealthy messaging out there. Some of the dialogue is, is vile, it's horrible uh, when, when you see some of comments that are, that are made out there. But I do wonder, I do wonder in 2020, when we've had the, the situations in the world that we have had um, with, with Black Lives Matter, uh, with people now starting to stand up for, for social justice uh, against racial discrimination, against racial injustice. I do wonder whether now people are prepared to stand up more for things, to, to speak out more, to, to, to extend a hand and to try and be an ally. And I wonder whether we might start to see a little bit of change of, of, of tone and change of action. I, I sincerely hope so in any case. Um, you, um, yet you're absolutely right to make the point about the, you know, the, it's perplexing, isn't it? The, the perceptions of, of male and female footballers and how ultimately it just, you know, it's, it's, it's flipped, isn't it? It's inverted. And, and, you know, the expectations of one to be straight and the other one to be gay. And that if you don't fit into those two boxes, uh, I've got a problem computing that. I mean, come on. This is 2020. Seriously, it's, it's nuts, isn't it? Um, the fear of marginalization, um, you know, really good question, I think, from Egdor about the notion of success and what that actually means. And, you know, essentially that success is everything just that's, you know, acquirable, right? You can acquire this, you can have, uh, you know, an expensive watch, a fast car and, and, a, and a beautiful, you know, girlfriend or, or wife. But why does it have to be that way? I, I, again, you know, I think it's, it's about breaking those things down. 
and really questioning why are they like this? You know, we should be really inquiring with ourselves. Uh, and also, I think, especially from my point of view um, as a broadcaster, I think that the language we use is really important as well. You know, I, I think that we use, you know, I've, I've heard people use the word gay to mean naff, to mean weak. Why do we do that? Just why? You know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm stepping out here and, and speaking myself, but I, I do think it's important that, you know, that people do ask that question and that broadcasters themselves, journalists, presenters, you know, we have an influence, I suppose, in society. We have to be very aware that with that influence comes a responsibility. Um, and, and that's really key. And, you know, certainly in terms of allies, um, well, you know, you, you mentioned, Tom, you know, Nick, Nick would be one. I would be another and the family grows. And I think, you know, we're all in this together, I, I'd like to say. So, you know, hopefully there is some the, some hope for the future. Like I said, um, a, a really impactful session, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your input. Uh, Tom, Nick, Hector, really appreciate it. Thank you again. And, and hopefully we'll have you again uh, with WFS another time. Awesome to hear from the guys. I think that was a really interesting discussion. Um, and, and we can go further in that discussion as well. Um, and I'm sure we'll have representatives from, you know, from the female community as well, talking about masculinity and, 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 and seeing their perspectives too. I think that would be important. I'm sure we'll do that again um, another time. Right, uh, we need to move on to our last session of the day. Uh, we've talked about big hitters. We started off with one, uh, one of our early sessions with Samuel Eto'o, three-time Champions League winner, of course, formerly of, of Barcelona, Inter Milan, Chelsea, Everton, and uh, the Cameroon national team. Well, we have another one to finish the day uh, is the president of La Liga, Javier Tepas, and that is coming up right away in a couple of minutes' time. See you then.